Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I will briefly discuss French theorist and scholar Roland Barthes' famous essay, The Death of the Author. Now, before I embark on my explanation, here is the plan, and this is how I plan to do it. Uh, I would like to move chronologically across the essay, so hence start from the beginning and then move through his argument. And my whole hope and purpose is that if you read the essay and then follow it through this video, you will probably get a better understanding of this essay. Now there is no need to give you a history of this essay or Roland Barth because I hope that you know, you're already familiar with it, or if not, you can always look it up. But the essay itself is one of the most significant short essays that inaugurates, in a way, this entry of the reader, right? And not simply as another component to an act of interpretation or reading the text, but as the ultimate place of determining or at least explaining what a text does. So that's why this is a very important essay. It's kind of also a bridge essay where Barth moves from his early structuralist mode to what would eventually become post-structuralism. And this essay, of course, is also significant for all those who want to privilege the reader and hence privilege the reader response criticism. So keep all these things in mind and then let's see how we can understand this really significant essay. So Barth starts with a quote from Balzac, right? And the scene is the authorial voice or a voice in the story looking at a castrato who is disguise, disguised as a woman and giving an opinion about womanhood itself. Right, and he says, this was woman herself with her sudden fears, her irrational whims, her instinctive worries, her impetuous boldness, her fussings and her delicious sensibility, end of quote. And then the questions that Barth poses of this passage is, who is speaking thus? Is it the hero of the story bent on remaining ignorant of the castrato hidden ben beneath the woman? Is it Balzac, the individual, furnished by his personal experience with the philosophy of woman? Is it Balzac, the author, professing literary ideas on femininity? Is it universal wisdom, romantic psychology? We shall never know for the good reason that writing is the destruction of every voice, of every point of origin. Writing is that neutral, composite, oblique space where our subject slips away, the negative where all identity is lost, starting with the identity of body writing. So along with that example is he gives us what he thinks of writing and hence about the status of the one who writes whom we call the author. We'll find the answer to this question towards the end of this essay. But the very question that is imposed is simply stating that if we subscribe, or ascribe, I should say, um, this particular statement, even to Balzac, we don't know which Balzac are we referring referring to where does this statement come from right and how do we know the meaning of it right and that is actually the quest in this essay right so then he goes into you know a certain specific form of linguistics theorized by J.L. Austin and others how to do things with words that's how you understand the next paragraph that as soon as uh, something is uttered as long as it doesn't have a transitive function, right? And that is that a transitive verb always needs an object, right? But if it is an intransitive statement, the moment it is expressed, it no longer belongs, you know, to anyone, right? The voice loses its origin. The author enters into his own death. Writing begins. 
because it does not have an object that it addresses, its words performatively expressed, that means they can no longer be connected to the voice from where they came. They detach themselves from the voice because the only thing that connects a performative act of speech to a subject is if it has an object, right? And writing by its very nature because it's thrown out into the world, right? Then begins when it detaches itself from the author, which when it is inscribed, that's the argument he is making. Um, and this idea of ascribing an author to an act of narration, he is saying is that's, that's the figure of the author is a modern figure, right? Because he gives you the example of ethnographic studies and the role of the storyteller in it. No one ever attributes the storyteller as the original constructor of the story. I mean, if even if you read uh, 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 the famous notes on the postmodern by Leotard, that's the role he assigns to the storyteller, that the storyteller is, is a medium through which a story that pre-exists him passes on to a live audience, right? This idea of the author, he says, is a modern figure, right? Produced in modernity because of, you know, ca capitalism, um, because of uh, uh, the culture that em emerges post enlightenment right and reformation and if you go to foucault whom who i also recommend what is an author foucault also talks about is that the figure of the author or naming the authors of the work is a tradition also started to 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 ascribe responsibility right to know who wrote what so that they could be sanctioned if the censors didn't like it but it is a construct of modernity right um, so, and that then lends to this tradition of criticism where any time we, we read something or see a work of art and he gives you the or, or examples of Baudelaire's work, Van Gogh, Tachowski, we are always looking at the work in a way becomes this medium to look into the consciousness of the author, right? And that he says that sway of the author remains powerful, right? Uh, even though new criticism has undone the author, but by actually talking about literary works by authors, it kind of reconstitutes the figure of the author. And in the French scene, he says it was Stéphane Malherme who tried to undo this, this thing by writing the kind of stories that defied the logic of being attributed to an author. He also gives you gives us the example of the most ambitious work of literature by Proust, right? In which he says that by setting up a story, a long seven volume work, I think, as a perpetual waiting because the writer, the narrator in the story cannot write, right? And that is what all the speculation is all about until at the end of the story, he says, okay, now I'm ready to write, and that's where the story ends. So the author within the fiction dies uh, right at the moment when he decides to write. And that also dispels this, this other idea that we associate with writing, and that is that, the, that if the author is the writer of the story, then there is a before and after, before the story, right? And then the author writes the story, so we tend to see the writing as something that was picked up from before and written in the after by the author. But what Barth is hinting at is that the story exists before the author, right? And what is more important is that language carries the story, right? And if language speaks through a subject, then it doesn't need an author, right? Doesn't need an individual. Language precedes the act of storytelling. And hence, you know, language, he says, knows a subject, not a person. And this subject, empty outside of the very enunciation which defines it, suffices to make language hold together. Suffices, that is to say, to exhaust it, 
and not capture it in a story, right? So that means that the role of the modern author then is not that of a creator of a story, but a scriptor, because the story pre-exists, the language pre-exists. Also, if you are coming from structuralist point of view, all the stories have already been written from a structuralist point of view. So what you are doing is innovating, mixing this part with that part. So there is a huge role of intertextuality. So how do we tell this is an authorial story or authorial intention? And so these are some of the questions that he's raising in the beginning of the essay. And then he goes on to suggest, you know, uh, the role of the modern scripter. And he says, the modern scripter is born simultaneously with the text, is no way equipped with the being preceding or exceeding the writing, is not the subject with the book as predicate. There is no other time than that of the enunciation, and every text is eternally written here and now, right? So a subject with book as a predicate would presuppose that there was a book that a person writes and then offers as an end product. But if the story already exists, if the stories already exist, if the book already exists in language and what all the author is doing is scripting it, then that originary moment loses its value, right? And then that raises the most important question in this essay, okay? And that is, you know, what are we looking for when we are looking at a text then? If not the authorial intention, or if not how a certain author puts together words and creates a story. So what is a text, right? And he says, we know that a text is not a line of words releasing a single theological meaning but a multi-dimensional space in which a variety of writings, none of them original, blend and clash. The text is a tissue of quotations drawn from the innumerable centers of culture. Now that's a purely structuralist claim, right? That there is no original story. If there is a story, it incorporates in it different cultural traces, historical traces, even the characters, individual characters can be composites of other characters that might have already existed. And so the author's role as an inscriptor then is to mix, his only power is to mix writing, to counter the ones with other in such a way as never to rest on any one of them, right? So the author doesn't express himself, right? He also already gives us something that is already available in this catalog, in this readily formed library in his mind, right? Of images, of stock characters, of, you know, cultural knowledge, cultural tropes. So in the end, all the author is doing is arranging those things. Where do they come from? how to define love, how to define women, how to define men. After all, the author is not coming up with them, but rather retrieving them from this dictionary, right? And it becomes a text to us. As soon as we pick it up and read it, that is when writing enters another realm, right? And that is the realm of the reader, right? Um, because the book or any text is not just the material text itself, right? It's an outcome of so many different significations, cultural, political, whatever. The author is not just this single person, right? Uh, the author is relying on all those things, right? And putting them together maybe stylistically, right? So. There is no way also for us to read a text and then assign everything to the author because the author cannot contain everything that's in a text in this single person. And the other thing is we don't really need the author to know how a text works, how its mechanism works. So what if we remove the author, right? So he says once the author is removed, the claim to decipher a text becomes quite futile. 
to give a tax and authorize to impose a limit on the tax, to furnish it, it with the final signified, which is the author, to close the writing. Such a conception suits criticism very well. Why? Because it helps us be precise, right? If we can have an authorial figure, right? And attribute whatever we read either in the, to the intention of the author or authorial experiences or the use of language, it makes our jobs really easy, right? Uh, but if you just look at the text and the writing, then the possibilities of reading it are endless because there is no transcendental signified the author, uh, signifier, the author, controlling it, right? And we already know in language what is meaning, right? I mean, meaning is one sign for another sign. So what then we do is instead of deciphering the text, we look at its weave, we try to distangle it. And if we are looking at the weave of, of fabric, he says, of a text, then we can perform multiple readings, but all of it happens when we remove the author the figure of the author as the individual character who controls the meanings of the text, right? So that's what I understand until now. Let's read on and see what else he has to say. So after explaining the authorial function as that of a scripter, right, and by taking away the authority of the author, what he's saying is that when we do that, it becomes a revolutionary act, right, because when we take away the author and do not assign a secret meaning to the text that we are trying to retrieve through an act of criticism, the possibility then is that we are trying to read the text in its multiplicity, and that is what he calls an anti-theological activity. And why? Because when we read a religious text, when we read a theological text, what we are looking into is, because we always attribute an author to it, which is, God himself, and we are trying to see the secrets that he reveals through the text. When we basically eliminate the author and read the text with its free play of signifiers, we have done the revolutionary act of actually removing any control from above on the text, right? And then he comes back to where he started, right towards the end of the essay. Let us come back to Balzac's sentence. The question was, who is saying that? And he says, no one, no person says it. Its source, its voice is not the true place of the writing, which is reading, right? And then he gives us an example of recent research on Greek tragedies, right? And what he's then telling us is that a study of these Greek tra tragedies by, by J.P. Vernant has suggested that there are always dual and layered meanings in the vocabularies and languages used in Greek plays and classical plays, right? But there is only one constituency that understands the double play of language, right? To whom the story is addressed, for whom it is performed, and who are those? The readers, right? Which gives us this idea that the meaning is not at the authorial end, right? If writing is an intransitive act, it doesn't have an object, but it has an addressee, right? Then it is that addressee, the reader, who will see different connotations, different con context and contextualities. So the only person who can make sense of a writing from which the author is ab absent will be the person reading the book, right? And that will be the reader. And that is why what he says is, we are now beginning to let ourselves be fooled no longer by the arrogant anti forcitical recriminations of good society. You know, that's a neologism that he creates, right? Um, in favor of the very thing it sets aside ignores, smothers, or destroys. We n know that to give writing its future, it is necessary to overthrow the myth. And what is the myth? The birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. So the myth of assigning meaning to the author or to an authorial figure. So let me reiterate again. He starts with a certain set of questions about a Balzac story. 
and then he poses the questions I mean who is saying this who's who do we attribute it to traditionally he says in literary criticism we always hold the figure of the author as this figure who has created the story and who holds it together for us so we spend a lot of effort on retrieving the authorial intention or author's biography his politics or her politics but what he's saying is that we don't really know and writing by its very nature is a mode of inscription because the author is not an individual the author is a subject right and this figure of the author was actually a construct of modernity and at best an author can be a scriptor right which means that the author already had the story pre-exists the author in language the author rearranges those things puts them in there but none of that can be called original and that layered meaning and everything else in a story after all is headed outwards right and the moment a text is finished it is written right the author is already dead so we should let him be dead because the only person who makes who can make sense or can construe different meanings from a text from writing or where the meaning comes together in one form or the other depending on the reader's own way of reading is the figure of the reader and that is where the act of meaning making in a way starts right at the reader's end and when we acknowledge that we actually do not need to know the author we do not need to know the authorial intention and it is not necessarily significant for an act of or acts of multiple interpretations so this is a very simplified explanation of a really complex essay but i hope this makes sense i do highly recommend that you should read the essay carefully look up the sources right and the people that he is ref referring to but overall this according to my limited understanding is how we can read this essay effectively that's all thank you so much see you next time and as always peace and love